We at the Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities are most pleased to kick off the first SLPS webcast of 2015 with an excellent presentation by Jim Powell, Assistant Professor at the University of Alaska Southeast and a member of the Jocelyn Institute Board of Directors. The Sustainability Leadership Presentation Series is a partnership between Central Community College, Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities, Metropolitan Community College, and WasteCat, Nebraska. We hope you continue to join us on the first Thursday of each month. Jim is joining us from Juneau, Alaska, where he teaches natural research, resource policy, sustainability, and public administration. His research includes community and institutional responses to climate change in Alaska, including Alaska Native observations and adaptation to total environmental changes. Before his position with UAS, Jim spent 28 years in environmental management focusing on water quality issues and wetlands management. Among other appointments, Jim served Alaska State Government as Special Assistant to, uh, to the Commissioner of Environmental Conservation and Assistant Director for the Division of Environmental Quality. His public service includes nine years on the City and Borough of Juneau Assembly with three years as Deputy Mayor. The deepened understanding of municipal decision-making and local environmental systems he gained during his years on the Assembly inspired his passion to to improve city-level planning through sustainability assessment, monitoring, and adaptation. Jim has a PhD in natural resources and sustainability science from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a master in public administration from the University of Alaska Southeast, and a bachelor of science in environmental studies from Eisenhower College at Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, Jim will also be uh, making a, uh, joining the High Lecture Series panel in Lincoln, Nebraska on February 20th at 4.30 at the Ross Theater. Uh, the panel will be discussing current sustainable design research at that time. Uh, as far as questions go, for, uh, please save your questions for the end of the presentation. You or whomever is convening the watch party at your location may type questions into the chat box to the host or share them via Twitter using hashtag SLPSThursday. I now turn it over to Jim. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK? Um, yes, we can. All right, I'm going to go go ahead. Uh, first, greetings to everyone. And uh, I'm so pleased to be able to link in to fellow Nebraskans. And uh, thank you, Kate, for the wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, Nebraskans, Alaskans, and other viewers that might be out there. Um, it really is a pleasure to speak about climate change in Alaska. Uh, we have a saying, we burn first up here. Um, and things are changing very rapidly. Um, and it's neat to be part of this uh, leadership, sustainability leadership presentation series. I'd also like to thank the organizers of the event at Central College and uh, Community College and the Jocelyn Institute. Um, they've been great um, setting this up because um, as I get older, my technical skills uh, tend to be challenged. Um, so they've done a great job. This afternoon, um, I'd like to present um, the major, some of the major changes, the rapid changes that are, we're actually observing, it's happening here, uh, observing in Alaska, and how we're adapting and mitigating to the impacts. This is not an exhaustive review. Um, however, I hope to give you a sense of the kind of ra uh, rapid changes that are occurring. So part of what's really neat about this and actually unique about this presentation is I'll also be showing uh, a video, a short video of indigenous and local residents in southeast Alaska. And they'll be sharing their observations of climate change, the things that they are seeing on the ground. This is the first public showing outside their communities where it was filmed. They have seen the films um, and approved them as part of the research process. Um, so you guys will be um, first to see it. And what's interesting about that, and we'll talk more about this through the presentation, is we'll compare those observations uh, with Western or science or instrument measurements. So we'll be looking at traditional local as well as scientific knowledge. That's one of the takeaways from the research that I've been involved with. Um, and then uh, we'll discuss approaches 
of how and what we've learned so far, and lastly, what knowledge or information is transferable to Nebraska about climate change? Because you guys are experiencing those or are likely to experiencing those in, in, the, in the in the near future. So this is who I am. Here's the title page, um, and uh, thanks to UAS. And actually, a lot of this information you're seeing in front of me was done under a, a, a past postdoctoral studies with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So thanks to them um, and also the U.S. Forest Service. So I should um, thank them. I always, I always like to, and this is the hard part, um, I think if you get the questions right, maybe you have uh, half a chance to maybe get to the answers. Uh, but first, these are some of the questions that have come to my mind in preparing this presentation. First, what are the environmental changes that are happening in Alaska? Um, what can we learn from Western measurements, Western science, and indigenous per, uh, perspectives? And up here, we, uh, in the lower 40, I think you call indigenous uh, populations natives or, or Indians. Up here, indigenous folks, and there are many tribes, um, we call them Alaska natives. So I will say Alaska natives and mean all of the, the uh, indigenous tribes in Alaska. How are Alaskan communities and institutions adapting? How are Alaskans mitigating those impacts? And what information or knowledge is transferable? Those are the kind of things that um, I'm hoping to hit. Uh, so my objective is really to give you a sense of how Alaskans are adapting, um, what kind of rapid social and ecological changes are occurring. And third, I hope this presentation triggers uh, new ideas, hunches, or maybe different ways to approach issues you may have been facing and how we can learn from each other about this uh, climate change and uh, maybe trade some um, tips, secrets amongst us. So those are the questions. I've organized my presentation into five, basically five different um, parts. First, I'm going to give you some context in case you haven't been to Alaska. I'll go over that pretty rapidly, but just to give you a sense of uh, who we are and what we do and some of the, the major things about Alaska that make us unique. And then, secondly, uh, we'll go into those observations and what's happening and how science um, is measuring those changes. And then we'll have the, uh, the video. And then we'll talk about adaptations that are occurring in the communities, which is really that video. And then institutions. And when I say institutions, I use the broadest sense of the word. That, meaning, that means um, agencies, NGOs, um, all those kinds of uh, um, organizations that are out there. It's not just um, city government. It could be federal, local, state, um, NGOs, and and those folks that are stakeholders um, here. What are they doing? How are they organizing themselves to adapt to these changes? And fourth, potential approaches and transferability. We'll talk about sustainability. And we'll talk about systems thinking, those kind of things. I think you know, we don't know uh, what those changes are going to be in the future. We don't know. We're predicting some, and those tend to be uh, coming true, but we don't know. There are what we call in the resilience theory surprises. And so not knowing what they are, it's going to have maybe an approach of, of uh, looking at the changes. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll end with, uh, I think we'll have about 15 minutes for um, Q&A, questions and, and answers. So first, I wanted to start with a poll that was reported in the New York Times, I think it was the New York Times, last week. And it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, we have uh, the New York Times, Stanford University, and Resources for the Future. They conducted this polls on views of climate change. And it was reported, like I say, last month. And it was interesting. 78% or more felt like it was a you know, global, global Warming is serious, very serious or somewhat serious. So I think that that's important because I think if you took that same poll 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago, you would have gotten a different, um, a different result. 
So I think public opinion is changing, and it's getting towards, it's getting on the radar screen. And it's really on the radar screen. It's on, um, it's in front of folks that are in the coast areas, um, as you know, um, those folks that are experiencing extreme weather events and other things that are happening in Alaska that we'll go into. But I thought I'd just bring that up. I thought it was interesting that happened last week. Okay, moving to facts about Alaska. All right, you've heard this before, you probably know, but I don't, it's hard to imagine how big we are. Um, so I was going to give you a sense of that. Uh, we're more than twice the size of Texas. Texas, you know, we got a lot of Texans in Alaska. It's pretty interesting. They're pretty uh, proud folks, but uh, this uh, is kind of, it is an interesting part of the discussion. Um, so we're t more than twice the size of Texas. We are 8.5 times as large as Nebraska. So we're eight Nebraskas, and we don't have many people. You know, we're only 700, and that says 710,000. It should be 700. And 30,000 now. Uh, so it's a small population, and, and more than half of that population is really around um, Anchorage and the urbanized areas around Anchorage. So they have over 30,000, half of that. And the rest of it is really split out uh, to the other urban areas in Fairbanks, Juneau, and south of Anchorage. Um, so that's what um, where the population is. Another thing about Alaska that I'll say real quickly is um, Forty percent of the land is owned by the feds, so they have a lot to do with things. Um, and I'm sorry, forty percent of the federally recognized tribes are in Alaska, um, and it's actually even bigger with the feds. But I come up with that factoid a little later. We're home of the largest uh, salmon runs, um, and I'll give you a factoid on there. We're in our third year of a moratorium on the Kenai River, where you get the biggest kings in the state, and we put a moratorium on that. We really don't know why. Uh, we're getting less return. Could be management, could be climate change, we're not sure. And we have we have half of the nation's uh, fish catch. We have 32 distinct ecoregions. It's like looking at Florida and uh, northern New York State or Nebraska and trying to talk about them all at once. We are very diverse and very, um, very different. Now, looking at the changes, what we know, what science knows, since the 19, 1949 to 2011, on this map it shows the change in temperature alone. Look at the north part of the Alaska, it's 4.9. Look at some of the southern parts, 0 0.9. And where I live in Juneau, down in southeast, it was 3.1. So yes, the, the, the temperature is changing. That's almost 5 degrees, and that's an annual mean temperature. We'll get into that a little bit more, more detail. Uh, more temperature change at the local level. This is one of the towns that we're going to be looking at as far as the video. And this is Yakutat. That's basically uh, in between Anchorage and uh, it's in between southeast Alaska and uh, you'll see it on a map in the video, uh, and Anchorage. It's a coastal community. These trends, the, the gray bars are 1961 to 1990, and the red bars at the top are projected to 2099. They're all in an upward projection. These are based on models um, and also uh, different climate models that have been regionalized. The big GCM models, global climate models, have been regionalized by the University of Fairbanks to get a little bit more specific on how we're going to be hit. Precipitation. So you have temperature and then you have precipitation. Those are two of the big drivers. Yakutat again, this is precipitation. Precipitation is going to go up. Precip and rain going up, going to increase. And again, you have the different bars and different time frames there. Um, drivers of change. OK, if you got warmer weather, uh, and we are warming twice as fast as the rest of the nation. Okay, It's expected that, you know, right now we're on an average of 3 to 6 degrees. And, and the problem is, is that it's not equal through the year. This is happening during the winter. And we have certain traditional things we do during the winter, and we depend upon that cold, like permafrost. If permafrost goes away, what happens to the roads? Okay, sea ice is rapidly receding, and, and glaciers are shrinking, uh, thawing permafrost, drying uh, landscapes. Uh, I've got some neat pictures of that. We'll go into that. Loss of ice. We need 
that for um, in the village where you have permafrost, they use that fact in frozen ground to help us um, with um, cold storage. Those are that's just a one example of, of adapting to that, but now we have to adapt to something different. Here's some other projections for change. Temperatures projected, as I said, um, going up. And in the northern parts, it's going to rise. Remember, it was uh, five, almost 5 degrees right now. Well, it's, gonna, it's projected to rise 10 to 12 degrees. That's a big difference. And this loss of ground is, is uh, going to gonna change things. The growing season, because it's getting warmer, that maybe is a positive thing. Um, it's increased 45%. We're going to get 20 to 40 days more of growing season, and you Nebraskans maybe can appreciate that, uh, being in a very agricultural state. That's huge. That's maybe a benefit for us. Uh, the increase in precipitation is going to increase 15 to 30%. We already get 30 to 60 inches of rain in Juneau. I'm not looking forward to the increase myself. Um, but And I'm not looking... <laughs> I'm not looking uh, for the more snow I ski, I mean more rain than snow. Um, and it may, it may impact other things that we do, like and depend upon, like hydroelectric. 99% um, of our town is powered by hydroelectric. Um, and the way, the amounts and occurrence, when, how much affects our hydroelectric, um, we hope it. And then the other thing we have is, uh, we have insects up here. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this other factoid of Alaska. Uh, what's the state bird? It's a mosquito. Um, because we got lots of them. <laughs> and they are big. They are huge. They're incredible. Well, they're supposed to get worse as, uh, as things get um, warmer. Here's an image. Hopefully it uh, has come out all right. This is what happens. Our public infrastructure is impacted. This is a road picture taken by DOT. This was a couple years ago. Uh, you can see by the road there, there was a, there was a river. Well, as permafrost melts, it um, seriously compromises the, the road structure underneath, and we get this, this kind of stuff happening. Other things, and some factoids for you, it's projected that infrastructure, um, as it wears out normally, that's going to um, actually be increased in, in cost because of climate change. And here's some estimates. We estimate that it's three to six billion dollars more due to the cost of climate change, um, and that's just between 2006 and 2030. 2006 and 2080, it gets up uh, even more. And here's the likely share of those of those extra costs by 19, or 2030. That pie chart you see that runways, roads, uh, water and sewer, all those things are. Uh, all those things are affected, and those are some estimates about how they are affected. Here's some nice uh, pictures to illustrate in a graphic or image way of how things are affected. When hotter fires, you guys probably have heard that. You've got it in the lower 48. What's different up here is we have permafrost. And under the permafrost, what's happened is they're burning hotter. Um, and and that's not so good because there's an, there, there was a natural cycle to forestry. And I'm not a forester, but uh, what happens is when it burns hotter and you're changing uh, from permafrost to non-permafrost, um, you're getting more burns and they aren't recovering as fast. Um, so it's different. As we get warmer, the... Um, um, evergreens, the, uh, uh, you're moving to more deciduous forests, probably, we predict. Infrastructure, we have a thing called a pipeline. Uh, you know, 90% of our, over 90% of our, our wealth comes from the North Slope, and it's piped through a line. And that line was built on permafrost. If you see in that image, you can see these little spikes that go up. Those were to dissipate the permafrost below. What happens when there's no permafrost? <laughs> You're going to have a line that's going to be that might be repaired that runs from the north part of Alaska down to Valdez. That's going to cost something. Subsistence resources, fish and wildlife. Um, that's an important aspect, and I say the word subsistence is an important word to Alaskans and also very important to Native Alaskans. That's a concept. 
it's a relationship. It's not just food and sustenance. It's a relationship natives have with their environment and their food and way of life. That's going to be affected, and you guys are going to hear a little about that in the video soon. Shishmaraf. There are three villages, and we'll name all of them. You'll see a slide on it, but this is a picture. It's a classic picture you can find online. It's Shishmaraf, where we've had to relocate villages. Three are being relocated now, and there's many more, and I've got some factoids to show you on relocation of villages. Because a lot of villages are on the coast or on water where permafrost is, is melting and it's changing um, the ground, which upsets infrastructures, where they are, uh, closeness to the, the shore, those kind of things. What happens is there's a lot of uh, ice that traditionally was there but now is melted, so it doesn't protect the coast. So you have no protection, and underneath it's melting, so it just withers away um, the, uh, the shorelines. Hydro. Uh, We'll see. Um, total amount, seasonal water availability, snowpack, all those things may have uh, impact to us. Other impacts. Um, changes with location dramatically. We have a lot of micro, um, micro environments, and that's important to um, recognize. And that also goes to species. We may have as, as it gets warmer, um, um, many things could be impacted. That's why I think when you're looking at, and we'll hit this hard at the end, that's why we're really looking at, have to look at this stuff through a systems approach. So we look wider than just one impact. We've got to start looking broader and more of a systems approach when we look at climate change. That's what we're finding out anyway. Um, Anyway, there's impacts to wildlife, there's impacts to economics. Um, it's it's uh, really across the board. Here's a nice picture of Alaska. Uh, these are, there are many villages in Alaska. The red dots show where there's potential erosion or flooding that will occur. 184 out of 213, 86% of the Alaska village to some extent are going to be hit. 31 of those communities, as put in a, a, a GAO report, that's a um, government accounting uh, office, I think I got that word right, um, in 19, or I'm sorry, in 2009, considered 31 of those villages eminently uh, threatened, and 12 we need to relocate, extremely expensive to move villages. But let's um, look at potential then, uh, benefits. We need to look at that side of the equation. Increase in agricultural production. We do have agriculture, incredible agricultural production. Not much of it because of our long days. We get these humongous big, I should have put some pictures in, of, of uh, vegetables. If you've ever seen them, they look like they're out of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, because of the extended growing season, that's maybe a positive. Expand the window for tourism in parts of the state. That could be considered positive. Uh, scientists predict ice-free Arctic by 2020. Everybody's going to the Arctic. Uh, we have one of the we have the largest um, zinc mine in the world on the coast on the western part of Alaska. Uh, getting those uh, commodities to market uh, will be very important and will change when we have when we start opening up those routes over the Arctic and the impacts of that too. The impact on indigenous people may in fact be more severe as you could see by the uh, image of Sushmaraf. Okay, turning to the video. We're almost, I think we're staying right on time pretty good. Um, as the lead into the video that you're going to see, it's only eight minutes long, eight minutes and some seconds. It's really about a conversation. Um, this video, when I started doing my research, um, I was recording, this is, I was recording um, interviews. And I thought, then we're 90. I did 90 interviews of locals in villages in Southeast. And I'll show you where they are in the video. And I thought, well, why, why don't we make a video out of it and leave something, that, leave something like that for 
the communities as opposed to a presentation and an academic paper. And that was my motivation. Well, it turned into a big production because you want to do a good job, and there's such a high standard of videos now because everybody's doing them. Uh, it took a long time. It was more than two years. Um, but anyway, I think it turned out good. This is the shortest of three. Um, I understand eight minutes is a long time for people to uh, people's attention, but hang in there. I think you'll get something out of it. I think it's, uh, yeah, I like it. It's okay. And we talk about total environmental change uh, because we use that in research in Alaska because we don't know if it's um, management um, or overcatch by man. And they will talk about climate change because they, they'll be able to distinguish some of that. So we include climate change and environmental change up here as a matter of doing research. And you're the first audience. So, Nanetta, um, if you want to go ahead with the video. Well, there's, there's the video. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, what I was trying to get across is uh, some of the observations that indigenous folks have. And the, one of the assumptions going into the research was that uh, these folks have lived on this land for tens of thousands of years in those same communities. They are linked hard to the resources. And so they know. Um, and the assumption is if they are changing, they would um, could talk about those changes. Researchers go out a matter of weeks or maybe even months, and then we go home. Um, they live with the resources, so they have that close connection to the resources. Um, there were a lot of other comments, but in eight minutes I could only, um, that's the uh, best we could do. So I'm going to um, show the next slide, which I want to walk through. And it looks like I have um, some time in front of me. So I'd like to walk through three of these slides that you see. On the left side are characterized very briefly the local perceptions, their observations and perceptions of change. And this is the first one about climate. And then on the right side <coughs> are uh, what I call instrument measures, measurements, or Western science, you could say. So I'm going to walk through these, and you can see how they compare. Weather is unpredictable. You heard that a lot uh, from them. I used to be able to read the clouds. I used to be able to go out into the ocean, go fishing, and read the weather, know when to go out, when to come back. Remember the lady said she, she could almost by the day go out and pick um, and gather her, her, her um, bark to do uh, weaving. She can't do that anymore. It's hard. So that's unpredictable. Science says no hard evidence uh, regarding unpredictability. We don't have enough to say uh, what's going on. It's too erratic. Uh, colder springs, there's mixed data on that. Okay, so not sure. That was her observation. Less snow cover, yes. Warmer temperatures are reflected in less snow. We both agree on that. Um, there's a strong correlation there. No more ice in bays. They used to be able to go out in some of these bays and use the ice for transportation. Can't do that anymore. Yes, large increase in temperatures. Uh, they've noticed also a measurement of ice has, uh, has also occurred that there's um, less ice. Winters, not as harsh. Yes, we also see that in measured science. Fish and wildlife, what are they seeing? Local perceptions. Sea otters going up. Yes, northern sea otters. However, I'll tell you, uh, basically, um, when Alaska was settled in the southeast, we, got, we basically overhunted them. And now they're coming back because we don't hunt them anymore. Um, so that's maybe a management, less of a climate change. And people realize that. But we both agree with that, that observation as far as that measurement. No change in seals. Yes, um, it looks like science, uh, measurement science would agree with that, too. Harbor seals are stable, increasing, or unknown, depending upon the specific uh, southeast location. Fewer bees. That's interesting. I think you guys may have 
be experiencing that more for day. Yes, virtually none known in, in uh, bee populations declines in Canada and the U.S. De deer population fluctuate. It's going up and down. They've no, known that too, but um, it depends upon the time frame that you're talking about. If you talk about pre-contact uh, or, say, pre this to 50 years ago, you get a different story, like the story that uh, the, the uh, individual was saying, we saw 50 deer. Um, I heard that too. There were so many, um, you know, you'd run out of ammunition and you'd start throwing rocks at them. Um, I mean, there's these stories about incredible populations. Well, there's still a strong population for, uh, generally speaking. Uh, next, salmon abundance. We're all about salmon in Alaska, even more so than oil. We are, we run on oil, but salmon are, we're, that's a cultural, strong cultural thing. And there's a downturn, and they're moving uh, as far as where they're uh, migrating to and, and stocks. So stocks abundance are down. However, some are, you know, there's, there's some mixed information on that. Herring abundance. Herring is huge. It used to be real huge before the 1930s. Uh, they were fish, they were hard fish in the 30s. But pre um, theories are some great stories about putting nails in a board and then just raking the board through the water to catch herring. There are so many of them. Um, they're coming back a bit now because they're being protected and we're managing them better. Whale population going way up. Um, they're increasing and we both agree with that and there's some fear about that because they tend to feed a lot, and they feed a lot on um, organisms that are part of the ecological net. If they're, if they're increasing, then something else maybe is decreasing, which may affect our fish. So we don't know. Uh, uh, we don't know, but we know the, the whale population is increasing dra drastically. So that was neat to find out and to do. Um, but what about us, and what about the communities um, what can we learn from natives and others and what we're doing up here? Well, Ron Bruner, who's a, a writer on um, adaptive governance and, and adaptive governance and climate change, uh, he's put out a couple books, um, great guy from University of Denver, I think. One thing I think it's really important, and they emphasize that in the films too, was uh, we need to decentralize. And I think that... Um, his statement, human cognitive constraints alone are not enough to force decentralization of decision making. We need, we are too confined, we're too centralized and too specialized. We need to go community based because we were, um, and we need to recognize that local knowledge, that being local and or traditional, uh, native and non-native. Uh, because we're around it. Uh, we have connections to it. Um, the federal government has helped us. The state government has helped us, but we need to we need to do that. I think that's one of the takeaways, at least. Learning by doing and networking, taking risks. We need to be taking risks more because things are moving fast. We need to try things. We need to learn by doing. Uh, coordination and integration. We'll talk more about that, integration and sustainability theory. Um, and systems thinking. Small organic steps, that was mentioned in the film too. I think that's really important to take small steps. Many types of knowledge. We have to leverage everything we can get. All right, I'm going to go into institutional change. You saw um, the film on community change and some broad things that we're seeing in the state. So what's the government doing? Well, government doing Federal government is doing a lot in Alaska, and there's a reason. 69% of the land is federal. It's managed by the Forest Service, uh, Park Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service. They just came out with a report fairly recently. It's called State of Change. Nice play on words. Um, and in that, um, they talk about the Denali Park and how that's changing. The roads are eroding away. Um, uh, vegetation is changing rapidly because of the precip and the warmness. Uh, Denali is in the middle of the state. If you you know, it's uh, um, very very popular, one of the most popular parks to go to in the state. So they are doing something, and the different agencies are doing a lot. Um, I'm interviewing those. I did some focus groups of those, and the U.S. Forest Service, uh, for example, does a report card 
um, that's mandated every year. What are you doing as an individual? What are your units within your organization doing? So the feds um, are doing a lot, um, it seems like, at least in Alaska. Um, they're trying to weigh in. There's a lot of committees. There's a, um, they're trying to figure it out. State government, different story. Um, I hate to bring up that name, uh, but the in 2008, uh, that uh, Governor Palin did a lot of different things, but one thing she did was she started a climate strategy group, and she signed an administrative order, the former Governor Palin, and she started this huge, uh, many committees, over 100 committees, on the science, the immediate needs, adaptation, and mitigation. They came out with a report. The report was finally delivered in 2010, 2010, five years ago, under this past governor, who now we have a new governor, Governor Walker, um, and under the previous one, it sat on the shelf. I don't think I'm overstating that. Um, there was nothing done. They came out, they did an incredible amount of work on impacts. And uh, so that was set on the shelf. So we really haven't done anything much at all as far as a state strategy or, or organized approach towards uh, climate change since 2008. And the report came out in 2010. The things we have done, and it's a collaborative work, it had to be, because we had to move, we're moving three villages, uh, Newtuck, Cavalina, and Unanakli. Those three villages um, were being eroded away, and they needed to move. Um, they needed to find shelter, roads, all the things that you need in a village. Um, very small villages. 31 more villages, as I said earlier in a, a slide, are in eminent danger from shoreline erosion and thawing uh, permafrost. So we have a lot more to do. We're, we're working collaboratively with the feds, the locals, the state. So they are doing something in the immediate needs of the impacts of climate change. But there's no kind of strategy pushing us forward. Um, this is the report that came out. And uh, that was the report on adaptation, the advisory group. that and, um, Former Governor Palin set up this sub-cabinet. She said it was really important. We can't mess around with this issue. Let's have a sub-cabinet, which is basically the heads of a few agencies. There's 14 agencies, state agencies, in the state of Alaska. And that represented about five. Uh, the resource agencies. In this state, we set up our resource management with a Department of Fish and Game, a division, I'm sorry, a Department of Environmental Conservation, where I worked. I also worked in and, and also uh, Department of Natural Resources. So it's natural resources, fish and game, and uh, environmental uh, conservation. We have three separate big agencies to look at the resources. And for all kinds of reasons, we're a resource state. So they came out with this adaptation report. And um, these are the things that they came out with. They said, you know, permafrost thawing and, and sea ice melting. Sure. These are four things that they said we got to do something about. Threats to coastal communities, there are 31 that were, were identified. Sensitivity to marine ecosystems and fisheries, increase in acidification and changes to the diversity, range, and distribution of uh, species. We don't know about studies that are done. We know some things, but Acidification is one thing that comes up a lot when you talk about scientists. Uh, you know, it's not a, a secret, but um, I think there's a lot of concern. There's grave concern of what that's going to do and the impacts to the ecological web uh, from the acidification, which is really an outcome of CO2 and deposition into the ocean. Um, so. Realizing that, the sensitivity of those, because we're so dependent, because we are a fish state, and, uh, and a lot of our industry is around it, too. Um, it's just under oil, actually, as far as bringing money and employing, employing a lot of people. And then the impacts and stress to subsistence lifestyles and, and uh, livelihoods. That's, a, of course, that's a big concern, our, our villages. And we have many, many, many villages. How are they going to adapt? and and move, and you can see in the in the uh, 
um, video that the statement was made a couple times. You know, we've been here a long time. We're going to figure this out, too. And uh, uh, we will change with change. It's going to be harder, and we're put on, but we're going to go back to our, some of our old ways. Um, they know they can't go back to all of them, but they can, they can um, use some of the local knowledge and the strong relationships they have among themselves. There's some the isolation of communities in Alaska. What is I, I, I'm um, digressing just a little, but it's a really important thing about Alaska. It was interesting. I was in a meeting the other day, and and there was a historian that said, "Oh, Alaska is really not unique. It's really not unique." Um, and the Constitution reflects that. The Constitution of the state really came from other states. Well, yes, it did. We tried to take the best from the other states. But it is unique in the way our culture is unique. I don't know if we learned it. I, I kind of think it, we learned it from the pioneers that were interdependent upon each other. They needed, they needed each other. And there was a dependency in relationships that, that occurred. I think that's our uniqueness in Alaska. I think some other states have that, um, where there's a lot of civility still, and there's a lot of social capital, you could call it, social networking, as research, researchers call it, where there's a lot of bridging and bonding going on. I think that is what's um, really unique, and it's going to it will take us through uh, hard times. And that's what they were trying to express there, that they're going back to their old ways. Um, depending upon each other and uh, depending upon the resources and 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 uh, capitalizing, if, if you will, on their knowledge of the local resources. It's going to get them through. Um, there's a saying in Alaska also, um, if you don't know the governor, uh, you're, you know someone that does. That's a good thing. That's accountability in governance and in institutions. Um, at the local level, I just talked about the feds, the state, now I'm moving to the local. As far as the local level, there are examples of climate change actions um, and sustainability actions um, as far as community-wide. In Juneau, there was a sustainability commission that was started back in the 1990s. Um, it was right after I got off the uh, assembly when I served for nine years. And so we have a commission. We're trying to do something about that. We're trying to measure sustainability. We're still trying to do that. Um, <clears throat> another town, Homer, uh, you may have heard it. It's a wonderful, picturesque town in South Central Alaska, coastal community. And then there's um, other collaborations that have been put together as nonprofits. This Sustainable Southeast has started. And that's a collaboration, of, I think, of a couple of conservation groups and, and part of a kind of a state agency. And they're into uh, energy conservation. OK, here's some adaptations that, specific adaptations that have occurred. We're into energy conservation because it's cold up here. And it takes a lot of energy to heat our shelters. So we're doing some interesting things, super insulated places. Um, and there's a picture of it, an example. Here's another shot. This is what I call family adaptation. Um, I think that's the right word. I kept thinking about that word. Um, they have won a world record um, in having the tightest residential building in the world. They're in Dillingham, Alaska, and which is by in Bristol Bay, if you've ever heard of the, the mine that they're trying to put in there. Um, anyway. These guys, smart guy, uh, Dr. Tom and, and Kristen, um, have an extremely energy efficient home. And it's measured in air tightness. And I don't know a lot about this, but um, I, you know, I, of course, I did my thing at my, my house and did the, the test, the air test, as far as tightness. But they have one of the, the tightest house. And consequently, they use a lot less fuel. And fuel is it very expensive. We pay $6 a gallon for heating fuel in Bush, Alaska. It's really difficult and expensive. On the rail belt, a lot less, because we have natural gas that's distributed, other than Fairbanks. Fairbanks is a different story. OK, kind of turning towards uh, some thinking. Um, OK, so 
uh, I went through institutional things, some of the things they're doing or not doing. Um, and then uh, federal government, real briefly, only as fast as I could in, in an hour. Well, where does this leave us? I think what I think is most important is to start thinking about having a, a systems approach towards problem solving. And I kind of do it in two ways. I use some of, uh, of course, I'm you know um, on the board of the Jocelyn Castle Institute, so I've been heavily influenced by those folks in a good way, and I agree with what they're doing. Their sustainometrics book that they came out with and their framework that they use, the five domains, I think that gives you a really good starting point on how to frame in more of a systems approach towards problem solving. United States and our culture, we've gotten really good at specializing, um, silo um, thinking as opposed to systems thinking. Um, we're really good at that. We've got to get up out of those silos and look more broadly if we're going to be more innovative, for example. We've got to look at the interconnections and, the, um, and we've got to learn how to integrate these Pick different domains. I like these domains because the sustainometrics approach towards a problem, and this could be this is very modular. You can use this for an office. You can use it for a building. You can use it for a community. I like that aspect of it. It's very transferable. When you're looking at adaptations, it's good to look uh, beyond a particular slice of a problem. Think of it more in systems thinking, and this is demonstrated in this image where there's intersections between them. Um, and I like that, just this Venn diagram of, of, of uh, the different domains and how they should um, intersect and integrate. Well, I go one step further, or and I think some of this is implied in the sustainability, but I like to bring it out. I teach sustainability at, at UAS, and I've got to write a paper on this. Uh, I get Cecil to um, help me with it. Systems thinking. To me, since systems thinking is a couple things. These are starting approach. Your framework, and I use sustainometrics and sustainability for climate change adaptation. And I look at it in these in these worlds, uh, these dimensions, domains, and I use three things that are important. If you look at, if you use these three approaches, and if you cover or consider those five domains, then I think you're doing systems thinking and sustainability thinking. Is it long term? That's huge. Not just 50 years, but 100 years or 150 years out. How are we going to change? Even though things are changing rapidly, we have to think long term. And context. Context is, is all about this presentation. That is, different types of knowledge, local knowledge. The context is really important. And in time and space. What, what, Context is all important. Consider the context you're in and use the knowledge you can, local, traditional, scientific knowledge. And integration is another key, I think, in this approach. Where can you integrate? Those are the opportunities and where you need to capitalize on. Where, where can you leverage? So I use those three approaches with that framework. Here's what we do in Alaska. This is more of a kind of an overview, and I just kind of put this together. It's the first time I ever kind of put this is kind of new, so it would be nice to get some uh, feedback on this. Because we are so different, because we have over 32 separate distinct ecosystems in Alaska, we look at things regionally. And it's been stated, and I was with some other researchers in Fairbanks, and we sat down with some um, elected officials and scientists, and we said, how do we do sustainability? How do we think about sustainability in Fairbanks, Alaska? We have this incredible energy cost. It's almost moving people out of that community. Um, and, and we have people that, um, if they hear the word sustainability, they're turned off. Um, and I'm just being very blunt. Um, so we came up with these four kind of things, think about, that are just undeniably needed as a human. Shelter, you need. You need energy, you need food, you got to have a culture. So that's a starting point. And these cross social ecological systems. 
you need to cross those systems to be adaptive and to sustain. Where do we do this? How do we do this? There are different, different contexts that, that we see in Alaska. We have a road system that goes from Anchorage and below Anchorage up to Fairbanks. That's considered a road system. That's number two down there. Sort of. and, and so that's Fairbanks, Kenai Peninsula, um, um, and Anchorage. And we look at things like we're trying to improve and adapt through energy conservation is huge, innovations, education. We're, we're urbanized. Um, we're not, um, we're, we're urbanized. Off-road system is hit on hard. Those are those small communities, coastal communities. What do we do with them? Hard to get to, very expensive energy. Um, isolation, though, creates opportunities and innovation. Coastal, we're looking at tidal power, sharing amongst ourselves, trying to integrate. We even have windmills in, in uh, uh, Kotzebue, and we're getting more windmills and known. We're trying to leverage as much as we can. Uh, interior in the off-road system, not Fairbanks itself that's on the road system, but interior communities. And these are very small communities, 150 people to 2,000, very small communities. Highly insulated shelters, and energy conservation. These are just ticking off a few things of how we're adapting to what's being, how we're being hit right now. It's energy, it's shelter, it's food, um, those kind of things. And then southeast Alaska, where I live, uh, because we depend upon hydropower, it keeps our costs down. We're going to do more of that, probably smaller uh, projects, wave, tidal. Community gardens keeps coming up again and again around Alaska. In fact, um, they have greenhouses they're starting to build in Bethel and other places. Biofuels is coming back onto the plate as far as um, energy conservation and use. It's going to be a combination of things. So kind of um, I'm, a, I'm moving up to out of time. So I think I'm, yeah, I'm getting close here. Uh, I leave with these kind of things. What about Alaska and Nebraska? Um, these kind of questions. What is our capacity as an individual and community to adapt? I think the opportunities and the way we build capacity is the way we think. Are we thinking integratively and systems thinking? I think is really important. How do we build it? Again, small steps. As mentioned in the, in the film, we take small steps, innovations, and we take risks. We learn by doing. Adaptive management tells us that. Local knowledge, open, I call it open architecture. When, when I get around the table and I'm with different disciplines and we're doing research, you got to take some leaps of faith. What kind of knowledge is that? You know, is it words or numbers? We have to start having a more archi open architecture of thinking and uh, respect for other dis disciplines. We've gotten so siloed with our belief systems and our knowledge bases We've got to start looking at a more open architecture so we're more adaptive. These are some, now, that basically finishes the presentation, but these are some research or resources I just kind of put up here. Uh, the Coal Climate, Climate Housing Research Center um, is doing some very innovative things uh, for Alaskans. Um, REAP, or what's called Renewable Energy Research Alaska Project, Alaska Energy Authorities been given a lot of money. And then uh, ICLEES um, um, is working with at least three towns, cities here in Juneau, trying to put them through this five-step um, assessment and what are you going to do with uh, mitigating uh, greenhouse gases. LEED certifications, we have more buildings up here, really nice tribal governments. Um, and then the National Climate Assessment Report that came out, that has a lot of good information in it, too. These are some footnotes um, that um, where I received, got some of my information for that scientific side of that chart. Um, these are footnoted. And that's it. So I'm ready for questions. And thank you for your time. Um, I'd appreciate any kind of feedback. Um, this is the first time I've really pulled together all of these things into one presentation. Um, actually, that's a shot of me and an opportunity for climate change. That's an ice cave. It was created in a uh, 
um, in the Mendenhall Glacier. It became a tourist site this summer, but it was incredible. It was the most incredible place I've ever been in my whole life, just the way that light plays on ice, and you go into this cave, and it's, it was just wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to remind everyone to get questions to Jim. You simply have to put them in the chat box, and you can find the chat box on, um, it's usually either above or below Jim's face on your WebEx screen. Um, you're looking for anything that says chat. Um, depends how you have your view set up. You could also tweet them to hashtag SLPS Thursday, all uh, no spaces. And uh, it usually takes people just a moment, Jim, to get their questions in because they have to type them out. If you would, uh, wouldn't mind going back to your references and just go through them real quick, uh, just let them display for a minute because this will be the only way people will be able to access your references is through the video. So if you could just go take a moment and go through each slide so people can see them um, while our first questions come in. I've got a question that I'd like to ask. What is the obligation of the insurance that this is going to be a change of the Okay, um, that was, I have to repeat it, so <laughs> I'm really sorry. Could you just say, how is the insurance going to be changing? Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. Good question. Okay, Jim, your first question is how is the insurance um, agents, uh, agencies are leading, um, yeah, industry, sorry. Um, um, I'm sorry, will you repeat it again? I saw some dogs came, come in and then I just repeat it one more time. Has changed, yes. Um, he's, uh, our guest is wondering if measures from the insurance industry are reflecting these changes, if you've seen anything in, along those lines. That's a really good question. I'm sorry I don't have a really good answer. I have property on the ocean, too, and uh, I know that my rates keep going up. I can tell you that. And uh, I don't know of, I've not heard of any different formula or measurements for um, increased costs or changes that are occurring. And I haven't heard uh, about the, the small communities, the three communities that I mentioned, as far as insurance that they may have had on their buildings uh, before, um, before they got washed away, basically. Uh, but it's a good, really good question. I'm sorry. I can get back to you on that. Is there a way that, um, Minetta, is there a way that I can uh, post answers to questions if I don't have the answers uh, immediately? Um, the best way would be for uh, that individual that asked the question to identify themselves with me personally, and then I can, um, we can connect them with you. Or, uh, Jim, if you would be okay, if you could go to your slide that shows your name and um, email, they could actually, if they uh, would like to follow up with you, they could contact you directly, and then, then you can just correspond with them um, that way. That would probably be the least chaotic. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good... Right at the end, yeah. So, Excuse folks, me. if you have questions for Jim and he can get back to you, it would be best if you... Uh, contact him and then he'll uh, be able to uh, further address your question. Okay, we have some other questions that have come in here, Jim. Um, with the Alaska budget so dependent on revenue from oil extraction, how does this impact long-term planning around infrastructure improvements and resources for sustainability planning and mitigation? We're trying to figure that out right now. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, we have a um, I'm trying to put it in percentage because big numbers don't um, mean anything, but well, I'll give you the big number and I'll try to get the percentage. Uh, we have, going into this year, because the drop in the oil, oil, the price of oil, not just the production, the production of oil in our state drops off at about 6%, 6% a year. Um, and we've, because of the price of oil going down, we are short $3.5 billion dollars. Our total budget, probably including the capital budget, is probably uh, these are old figures, but probably eight billion. So you can you can tell that's a huge chunk. And how are we going to make up for it? 
Well, as you know, we have uh, a permanent fund, and there's $60 billion in the permanent fund right now. We've never tapped the permanent fund, and uh, there is no written statute or guidance on how it will be tapped, which is really bothersome. Um, and so it, we're, we're in the new territory. Uh, but this governor, um, an independent, he seems to be a moderate Republican, um, says, you know, we're going to cut government first, and there's going to be at least, um, oh, a 12 or 15 percent cut, and we're going to draw out of some savings accounts that we can access out of the permanent fund. We can get through this for the next five years, but if it continues this way. However, after five years, we're broke as far as uh, enough revenues coming in. Then we will have to go to, and you may know, we don't have a sales tax, statewide sales tax. We don't have a statewide income tax. And we get back from the government uh, proceeds um, from the permanent fund. We get back, each of us, a check from the government varies from $500 to $2,000 a year. So we are not a poor state. So to say, how do we keep up with the adaptations that are needing to occur in, in climate change? Um, you know, we've got money. It's just it, we're not poor in money. We're a little slow in making decisions, maybe. But you know, I guess everybody is. So to answer your question, um, I think that uh, um, we're going to get through it. It's just because we do have, we still have resources, but we're going to have to change things. Things are we're going to. Um, the public is demanding that I think the public is demanding lesser government, and and so that'll happen first. Hopefully that helped. Okay, a couple more questions that have come in here. Um, what organizations are most essential for helping to shift from silo thinking to systems thinking, or how would you suggest facilitating this change in mindset? Well, I was just asked to be put on the governor, the new governor's uh, policy group on doing that. <laughs> uh, my clue is you get them all down, and you have you you start a conversation about uh, well in our state. You, you take that report that's been sitting on the desk for five years that, that, that in a very good way lays out a lot of the science and a lot of the impacts. So a lot of that work has been done. Now you have to implement it. And the way you implement it, I think that um, agencies, there has to be leadership at the top that says we need to meet as um, task forces at the cabinet level, so you have sub-cabinet levels on adaptation. Um, because if you don't start at the top, um, most reasonable um, employees will not do something they're not supposed to do or they're not directed to do. Um, and that's to collaborate and to, um, if they're not trained in this, to get some training and, and to start um, looking at problems with different people in the room and getting used to having different people in the room. They know as a cabinet, I, I uh, work for, as, you know, one, I attended cabinet meetings under uh, uh, Governor Hickel when he was uh, governor years ago. So I know a little about those cabinet meetings, not a lot, but uh, I know that they collaborate on problems um, as, as 14 agencies. But that's difficult to do with everything else pressing on you. I think that what you need to do is to have sub-cabinet level, how do we adapt, those kind of things. And we look at the science, and we look at the locals, and we and, and, and you do. You, you, if it's a local problem, say a community needs to relocate, you collaborate. You work as a team. It's teams and tasks, those kind of things that we don't do a lot of, but government is doing more of and needs to do it faster. And maybe there's changes in statutes. It need, we need to look at things. Uh, we need to learn faster and look at those feedback loops even faster than we are now. 
of some thought. Okay, we have another one here. Um, and I'm having to mute and unmute myself, so I'm always a little worried that I'm not <laughs> getting the audio correct here. Um, is Alaska unique in having established a sub-cabinet committee or climate change adaptation, or are you aware of other states also taking similar initiative? There are other states, and they kind of come and go with the governors, I think, who's at the top. Um, I, I think there are other states. It's foggy in my mind right now what those states were. Uh, back um, in 2008 to 2010 or 11, some of the more, it seems like uh, uh, there are some states that are doing it. I don't think we're unique. Uh, I can get that out, too. You guys ask me great questions. Please email me those. I'm interested in doing the research to finding out the answers. Um, but off the top of my head, where well, there's more innovation that's occurring in our country as far as con climate change, because it seems like there was more, uh, for whatever reason, cities were on it faster. Um, you know, the big example, of course, is Seattle and uh, their climate change um, agreement. Their mayors that all signed on to the climate change uh, uh, convention or whatever it was, they all got together and said, geez, we're going to, because they're hit directly. Feds aren't. However, the feds were moving in our state. The state didn't move at all after 2010, but it started to move with Palin, um, gov former Governor Palin. So you had cities that were moving fast because they have to show up first. In Juneau, where I live, there's no road going into Juneau. So if there was bad weather, you couldn't fly in, and you can't get a boat in here fast enough, guess who gets the clean-up stuff? We do, local government. We're isolated. And that and that demands um, self-sufficiency. So isolation works both ways. It makes you dependent upon yourself. And if bad things hit, um, um, you, you got to solve it. You, you, the, the Navy ain't going to get there tomorrow if things are if things are happening. Neither is a state. So, um, and we had that happen in Juneau. I'll give you an example real real quick. Um, our hydro was wiped out. We had an avalanche. It it it, it uh, tore down our power lines. And so, and we're something I wish you could, we were, but we're not. Is uh, we privatized our electricity. You guys are way ahead of us as far as having a public. That's my opinion. But um, anyway, it was privatized, and so the the local utility said, "Yeah, we'll have it fixed, and we don't know when. You know, it'll be a couple months." Well. They raised the rate 450% overnight because we had to go to diesel. 450%. You're paying 100 bucks a month, now you're paying 400 bucks a month. People were outraged. So um, we, had to, we had to do something quickly, and we did. We got real smart on what a kilowatt uh, could do for your house. Um, and and we, we did good. We did good. Uh, but it was, a, it was quite a, a lesson in self-sufficiency um, as an old, old, old there's a big story about that whole thing but we we I went from uh, I think about 50 kil I, I was wasting kilowatts but I got down to it was like a social network worked in our town in small towns um, that's gonna be the saving grace when things happen Okay, so can you uh, not ask me at the beginning if you ever get if we ever get questions and they're still coming in, so uh, hang in there. Uh, you're not done yet. Uh, can you give us more information on ice-free Arctic by 2020? What is the source for this? And you have at least two more after this, so uh, um, just FYI. Um, there's a lot of science on this. Google it. Just put Arctic uh, Free 2020. My information comes from the University of Fairbanks because they've been doing modeling, and those are some of the uh, experts in the world. Uh, they've been doing ice cores. They've been doing um, – there's uh, – if you go to the International Arctic Research Center, uh, that's where the scientists reside, and – they're related to a lot of other scientists, too. But um, that's where my information, that's where that source came from. University of Alaska, Fairbanks. 
And there's actually a unit I did my postdoc in. It was called the Scenarios Network for Arctic and, and for Alaska and Arctic Regional Planning. Um, that was another, that's kind of, they do modeling. They downsize the, uh, the GCMs, the Global Climate Models, to Alaska because we, we needed that information on a regional basis on, you know, is it going to rain more here or what's going to happen with the ice here, what about permafrost, those kind of things. But the Arctic, there's tremendous interest in the Arctic and uh, UAF is way involved in it. University of Alaska Fair Mix. So I'd like to take this moment just to ask folks, if you're thinking of a question, please uh, uh, get it into the chat box or tweet it or tell it to your um, individual in the room that's taking questions just so we have a sense of how many more. We're doing still great on time. And with that, I'm going to read Jim our next one in line. Uh, what is your current consumption of wind electricity? What is the near-term target? Oh, God. Another one I have to send you. Um, I only know that we do wind anchorage put up six. Uh, as you fly into Anchorage, you'll go over this uh, uh, small island. You fly right over the windmills. There's, I think there's 11 or 12 windmills, and they're, and they're going to double that capacity. I can't tell you the, the, uh, uh, how many megawatts they are, uh, but we have windmills in Anchorage. We have windmills on western Alaska where there's a lot of wind. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I can't give you the factoid, but I can get back to you. Please give me an email. I'd love to um, do the research and get it for you. It's not going to be, it, to, generally speaking, and I've talked to the mayor about it from uh, Kotzebue, uh, the Northwest Arctic Borough, uh, uh, Reggie Jewell. He, he was instrumental. He was a state representative to get him in there. Um, the, it's not a large percentage, and I don't think that there's a lot of hopes that it'll be anything out of the norm. Um, I think that it's going to be, I don't, I don't want to guess, but I bet it will be less than 10 percent. In villages, it will be maybe more. They're looking at 25, 30 percent. If they can do that, that's a huge amount. If They're trying to displace their dependency on, on oil. So please give me a uh, From Twitter here. Um, Looking at the economy, we have an economic system that encourages excessive uh, consumerism. Can we break away from this? Hmm. Oh, boy. Uh, well, I, I think there has to be incentives and disincentives to do it. It's kind of like, uh, yes, I think we can, but it's a long process because we have so much and there's no you know, what is the necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, I think that we don't, there's no necessity to do it because it's so accessible. So I guess we have to incentivize it. It's kind of like, uh, do you buy, you know, do you take your bags into the grocery store? I mean, I try to do it. I do it most of the time, but not all the time. But when I go to Lower 48, when they get, and then there's no, uh, we don't charge here in Juneau to do or not to do that, and I don't think there's any place in Alaska. We're trying to do that now. There's some people trying to do something about that. But I go to California and they charge you five cents. I bring in my bag, you know. So we need those incentives to do it. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I think it'll be very slow. Okay, um, I think we have uh, another one here. Hang on. Uh, you mentioned adaptive management as a strategy to, uh, strategy to test innovation. A great example of this uh, at work in Nebraska can be found in the Platte River Recovery Project. I think it's more of a comment, but if you would like to comment on that at all. I don't know about the Platte River Project, but um, adaptive management um, has many aspects to it, but um, the, the cornerstone to adaptive management is experimentation, not just trial and error, taking risks um, and doing things that create a learning environment. And I can tell you that that doesn't occur in agencies across the board. In some it does because they have a culture of doing it, like the Department of Fish and Game here. We're fairly well managed as far as fish and game. We try to learn from 
other examples. We still have robust fish runs. They are changing, but we do that by science. It's science first, and then we make decisions, so we do it in a statement. We count the fish that are coming back, and if there isn't enough based upon history, we cut the amount that we allow fishing in some way or another, so we manage it. That's a scientific kind of management. It's not always an ecosystem management. It's by species, so I would, I would note that. But a lot of our agencies are not set up. If you're talking about institutional adaptation um, or, or government adaptation, we don't do enough risk. Number one, we have to change um, our risk policies, and that is being rewarded for making some mistakes and going too far or taking risks. Um, I know that sounds a little counterintuitive maybe, but we have to make some mistakes to find out which things work. And we have to learn. So we have to really apply the feedback loops, and we have to do intentional expect, uh, um, experimentation. And, and that's not done. There are some models. We have to extend those models into different agencies. So yeah, I, I believe in adapt, or, uh, adaptive management, and I think that's really important for climate change because things are soaring. They're moving fast, so we need to adapt. Well, how do you adapt? You do use adaptive management techniques. Okay, so um, folks, we're wrapping up pretty shortly soon. Uh, soon so uh, Twitter or chat box for your qu last questions. It's hashtag LPS Thursday or you can type it directly into the chat box if you're watching um, electronically or tell your person in the room. Uh, Dr. Powell, if you could go to slides uh, 34, um, 35, 36, 37, just scroll um, right from there and then into your next one. Um, and then your next one, we'll just make sure people will be able to get access to these later if they want to see them, 37. Uh, and then one more, and that's great. I think it will just allow folks to pause the video if they want to look at any of those references um, when the video gets posted. Um, while we're waiting for other questions coming in, I just want to I try to report our viewership so you know and other folks know how many people watched. We never get all of our viewership numbers, but I have 122 of confirmed heads uh, electronically and I had all of our different sites. Um, I always tell our speakers that anything over 100 is just excellent for um, Nebraska because our population is um, not New York. So I think that's just wonderful. We have that many people tune in. And that's actually without our Hastings campus because they lost power um, later so, or quite at the early part. So maybe some of those folks were unable to get connected. Um, and I'm t we're, uh, that's my pause. So I'm going to take our questions here one more time. Anybody else? This is your chance. If I've missed one, alert me to it now. Um, uh, Dr. Mary Ferdig has uh, asked me to connect you with her, and she's very interested in the question responses. So I will CC. Uh, I will connect you guys by email um, um, following this presentation. Uh, Jocelyn, Jocelyn, their watch party is looking good. They've given me a, uh, giving you a thank you. I think it's uh, been a great, great presentation. I'm still looking for any other last questions. Let me check the Twitter. Okay, with that, I think we're um, we are great. It's right on time too. Just perfect. Um, uh, we're going to clap in Grand Island for you uh, since you can't hear the other hundred people clapping. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I really uh, uh, appreciate it. And, and please, uh, the questions that I wasn't able to answer on the spot Please email and me because you, you, I'm also interested in the answer and I can probably access the, find the answers uh, quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Uh, for, for, I think we are talking over each other. Hopefully people got that. But yes, please email him and, um, and he would love to be in contact with you. And with that, uh, thank you very, very much. Folks, our next presentation is March 5th at 3.30 from Waste Cap, Nebraska. 
You can get information on their website or any of the partner websites, which is Central, Metro, uh, Community College, and um, Jocelyn. Uh, the title of the presentation is Sustainability Advocacy, Leverage Your Emotions, Avoid Burnout, and Influence for Good. We hope to see you then. And with that, thank you, Dr. Powell, very much. Uh, we will be in contact, you and I. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.